Please turn to Hosea chapter 6. You'll find this on page 875. As promised, I have just a few seconds to say something to the people listening on the cassette. Uh, we don't forget you're listening to us um, each time uh, we have these meetings. But tonight you may hear some funny background noises. This is not rebellion or shaking of fists from the congregation. Uh, it's the 5th of November, 1997, and there's a great deal of permitted explosion going on outside, and some of which may go on inside, judging by the, what we've experienced in previous years. Okay. Now, here we are in Hosea chapter 6, which is telling us to return to the Lord. So let's, let me read the chapter while we follow. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, that he will heal us. He has stricken, that he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. O Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, and like the early dew it goes away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like light that goes forth. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But like men, they transgress the covenant. There they dealt treacherously with me. Gilead is a city of evildoers and is defiled with blood. As bands of robbers lie in wait for a man, so the company of priests murder on the way to Shechem. Surely they commit lewdness. I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel. There is the harlotry, the prostitution of Ephraim. Israel is defiled. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you when I return the captives of my people. My introduction is the same as every other time I've spoken about Hosea. Now, this is a book about God and his dealings with backsliders. Backsliding, we've been told in the book, is prostitution. Prostitution is when you have a love or a union which is greater than the love or the union you should have. And backsliding is actually really not the best of words, is it? Backsliding is when I have a greater love than my love for God. That there's something else there's something else that I love more than him. So Jesus describes it in the parable of the sower as the desire for other things. <coughs> now that's where all spiritual ruin is found. At a given moment, if I love something, some experience, some person, some object, some hope, some thought, more than God, at that given moment I am backsliding. Because the first commandment and the greatest is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. God deals with backsliders, we've been finding out, in different ways. Backsliding always carries grief, and sometimes God lets us burn our fingers. Backsliding is serious, it's this prostitution we're speaking about. Sometimes we have stern, very stern warnings. Nonetheless, it's the backsliding of God's people, and very often God puts his arm round his child and speaks to him tenderly in loving whispers. Sometimes he uses one method, sometimes another, sometimes two, sometimes three. And we've already seen in the first five chapters examples of all those different methods. Now Hosea will tell us in the first three verses what God wants the sinner to say. Come and let us return to the Lord. 
take off the word re and we have the word turn which is actually the Hebrew verb there scripture teaches that there is no returning without turning so we've got to turn away from this greater love whatever it is turn right round and go back to God so that turning, turning round from a greater love is repentance turning round my doing it is conversion going back to God is reconciliation and just as we turned originally then the scripture is saying come let's do it again let's do it again if we've got some greater love in our lives let's do it again come on let's do it says the word of God through Hosea because God has torn us that backsliding always carries his own pain its own grief, its own pangs of conscience, its own consequences, its own fruit, its own distress, its own bitterness. And that's God's will that when people backslide they should suffer. And the claws which tear at us when we're not walking right with God are God's claws. Because behind every second cause is God. And we should look at the first cause in Scripture not be too held up with second causes chapter 5 verse 14 look at that chapter 5 verse 14 I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah so God himself is doing the tearing now chapter 6 verse 1 he has torn but he will heal he has stricken but he will bandage he will bind us up. So just as surely as you suffer as a backslider, if you turn back to God, just as surely he will heal you and meet with you and he'll rub the ointment in and deal with you tenderly and kindly. Just as surely as you've seen God's frown, you will see his smile. Just as surely as you've experienced distance, you will experience closeness. That is part of the story tenderness of Hosea's these are wonderful these first three verses whatever does verse 2 mean after two days he will revive us on the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his sight uh, let's not get too hung up on uh, upon Hebrew and things just think about it in English uh, you might say to a friend when am I going to see you again and they'll say soon but when do they mean? When, I, when am I going to see you again soon? Do they mean ten minutes? Well, they might say two or three days. And that's exactly what Hebrew is saying here. Two days, three days, in chapter 6, verse 2, simply means soon. So very soon, God will revive us. Very soon, he will raise us up. You as the backslider, I as the backslider. Come on, let's come back to God. He will meet with us, as sure as sure can be. And very soon, that spiritual life will be throbbing again through our soul. And very soon, he'll raise us up. We, don't, we won't be limping anymore. Very soon, we'll be back to our spiritual walk again, that we may live in his sight. Very soon, we'll be conscious again of the presence of God in our lives. So what does God want to hear the sinner say? Well, verse 1, come and let us return. And verse 3, let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. God wants to hear me say that I'm not just turning away from my first, this, this thing which has become my first love now and back to him. But in the future I'm going to pursue knowing God. My ambition in future is, is going to be to, to know him. Now, that was Paul's quest in Philippians 3, that I might know him. But he already knew him, Paul. Yes, but there's more to know. There's more to discover. There are more panoramas to see. There's more truth to understand. There are more experiences to have. God is infinite. He's like a fathomless, infinite sea. And we can know more and then more and then more. And when we set out on the knowledge of God, verse 3, his going forth is established as the morning just as surely as light follows darkness 
just as surely as morning follows night, just as surely if you return to God and set yourself to seek him, he will come to meet you. Just as surely as the rain falls twice a year in Palestine, and you've had one lot of rain, just as surely later on you'll have the other lot of rain, just as surely as that, God will meet with you if you come back to him. So there we're really actually standing on the mountaintop. I've often said in sermons that the Old Testament is, like a set of mountains. I've often said that the highest peak is Isaiah, though it's not the last peak. I actually believe that. But I think one of the high peaks of the Old Testament is actually Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. There's a freeness and a fullness and an invitingness about that, which is little short of wonderful. How wherever you've been, whatever you've done, come back, set the seeking God, and he is there to meet you, and your spiritual life will be what it was before, and even possibly even better as you pursue the knowledge of God. But they didn't. Verses 1 to 3 is what God wants us to say. But verses 4 to 6 is the response that God was getting at that time. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it, verse 4? It's such, such an anticlimax. You see, God with his hands out, as it were, in verses 1 to 3. Or oh, did they run into those arms? Well, they didn't. Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do to you? Or what shall I do with you? Oh, Judah, what shall I do with you? There's your faithfulness. Here's the sinner. He comes back to God. Lord, from now on I will serve you loyally. Lord, from now on you will be my first love. Lord, I won't do it again. Lord, I'm coming back and I'm coming back to stay. Your faithfulness is like a morning cloud. There it is. And now it's gone. Verse 4. And like the early dew, it goes away. Does it recall it? Remind you of a hymn, by the way, that one? <coughs> Verse 4. The early dew of morning passed away by noon. Tell me the old, old story. It's in there. And that's the experience of, of, that God is having at that moment. They're saying, yes, Lord, we'll come back to you. We'll embrace you again. But those promises, those intentions, it just evaporates like the dew. And then it's gone. There's not a sign of it anymore. So it's heartbreaking, isn't it, verse 4? God is inviting the sinner. He makes his promises and he doesn't keep them. Hence my words and actions, says God, verse 5. I've hewn them by the prophets. Prophets have come to a backsliding nation and they've literally killed the people with their words. They've chopped them to bits. They've slain them with their words. They've wounded them with the things that they say. And, the, and your judgments, verse 5, are like light that goes forth. In other words, the judgments that fall on you are just judgments. Because there is the tenderness of God. There are your promises, says Hosea. Nothing's come of it. That's why the prophets spoke as they did and the judgments which are coming, well, they're as just as just can be. There's, they're all light and no darkness. Verse 6 is very profound. Many people respond to spiritual backsliding by religion. And sometimes people are far from God and they're aware they're far from God. So, they give a lot of money to the church. Or some people are very, very far from God and they, they get involved in some Christian work. It's a sort of self-imposed penitence. Penance, shall I say. And that's what was happening here. We're far from God, so let's give him lots of sacrifices. We'll give him lots. Let's give him lots of burnt offerings. So we don't even get any of the animal for ourselves. There's nothing in it for us. We'll burn the whole thing up. That's not what I want, says God. I don't want your gifts. As Paul put it to the Corinthians, I don't want yours, but you. So what, what you've got to give, it's you I want. And when I've got you, uh, then of course the gifts will be fine. 
because there'll be expressions of you. But don't give me gifts instead of you. I want mercy. Verse 6, which is covenant steadfastness, covenant love, and the knowledge of God. I want you to deal truly with me and others. That's mercy. And I want you to know me. It's a personal relationship I want. It's you coming to me, says God. Don't buy me off with religion. Don't try and please me with ritual. Something which is external and doesn't go to your heart isn't you. So there is God inviting and that's the response he was getting. And in fact it was worse than that. Because verses 7 to 11 now reveal to us the extent of Israel's sin. Some of this is quite difficult um, to translate and some modern versions have actually cheated a little bit. They've put things there which aren't there in the text to try and make it make better sense. Verse 7, but like men they transgressed the covenant, there they dealt treacherously with me. You could translate like Adam, they transgressed the covenant, but you can't translate at Adam, they transgressed the covenant, because that's not what it says. I think we should just let it stand as it is here. Like men they transgressed the covenant, there they dealt treacherously with me. In other words, they were a covenant people and everywhere they were behaving as if they weren't a covenant people. They were covenant breakers, just like men and women are. To err is human, said the ancient world. To break a promise is part of our fall on humanity. And they're God's covenant people and they're just behaving as if they weren't. And now we go on a mini tour of one or two towns. And we find a catalogue of what was going on in Israel. Verse 8, in Gilead, just evil and bloodshed. Verse 9, in Shechem, priest murdering in what sense we don't know maybe literally but whatever it was it was so horrible you couldn't look on it which is the meaning of the word lewdness verse 10 I've seen a horrible thing in the house of Israel there is the prostitution the harlotry of Ephraim Israel is defiled the whole nation was given over to spiritual prostitution and many of them, as we've seen already, to literal prostitution, which is the physical fruit of the former. It was... So here is an inviting God. Nothing is coming from his invitations, and instead they go further and further and further down the path of sin. Verse 11 is very difficult. Matthew Poole says it's just about impossible to know what it can mean. So if he doesn't know, I'm sure I don't. Also, O Judah, a harvest is appointed for you. Does that mean a harvest of judgment? When I return the captives of my people, but it could be in Hebrew, when I did return the captives of my people, or when I will return the captives of my people, or when I am returning the captives of my people. I don't really know what it means, frankly. But I think the, the, the thrust of it is, is, is straightforward. That... Hosea is basically speaking to Israel but he's never let Judah off the hook. There is chronic backsliding, apostasy, almost without limit in the north. It's more moderated in the south but that doesn't mean that it must escape stern words. But perhaps he's saying that God has a different destiny for Judah. Israel, as you know, came under a the judgment of God went into exile and that was the end of that nation. Judah came under the judgment of God, went into exile, but came back. At least a remnant came back. And from that remnant the Messiah was born. Maybe that's a reference to that. But let's not lose the message of the chapter. If I walk away from God, if my spiritual life becomes cold, if I love something more than Him, What awaits me if I come back? 
what a welcome does. That's the gospel. We understand the fullness of it when we come to the New Testament, when we see the work of Christ and the cross and the eternal love of God and the freedom of the gospel invitation. But there's always a welcome for the returning sinner. What happens if I don't come back? Then there's always judgment for the stubborn person who won't come back. So always it's life and death which is put before us. And life is always when we come back to God and death is always when we don't. And so we go back to the first verse. Come and let us return to the Lord.